everybody. It's, well, it's a few months from Oscar night. A couple months. One month. Oh, man. The Oscars are next month. Hmm. And I have now seen all of the Best Picture nominees, so I'm going to talk about all of them. I've already talked about one or two of them in other videos, but I'll just um, go over them again. Actually, the only one I've done its own video for that I've put up is Lady Bird, but whatever. So, we'll start with Lady Bird. And by start, I mean, fuck Lady Bird, I'm done talking about Lady Bird. Um, next, we're gonna do this sort of in a countdown, count up thing. We'll lead into what I think should win uh, Best Picture. So, we'll go with my second from the bottom, which is Call Me By Your Name. Um, is a gay romance between two dudes, although Elio isn't fully gay, and neither is Oliver. Um, I... I'm betting that this movie is getting the attention that it's getting because it's gay. But it's not... There's nothing more really to it. It's just summer romance thing. So, let's see what it's got going for it, sort of. Oh my god, my notes for this are an absolute mess. So, this is going to be all fucking over the place. Um, well, the aesthetic... As you can see, if I remembered in editing to do it, just to click the one button, um, I really like the movie aspect ratio of 235 to 1. As far as I know, Call Me By Your Name is like maybe 18 by 9 or something. It's not, it's not wide shit like I'm doing. Um, and then it's also shot on, it looks like it's shot on film. It's like grainy and undersaturated as hell. It's got like lo-fi aesthetic to it that I kind of don't like because it's set in like the 60s, I think. And it kind of annoys me when I'm well, like a modern movie, they make it look like it was shot using the technology of that day because like technology has moved on it a movie doesn't have to look like the period that it's set in just because it's an old movie set in a or just because it's set in a time with shitty technology doesn't mean you used shitty technology to shoot it and that it has to look like shit just let the movie look good and i will like it more um, speaking of the aesthetic, they bother to mention in the credits that it was shot on only one 35mm lens, which, this is a 35mm lens. This is not a hard focal length to work with. This is actually one of the easiest focal lengths to work with, because it's not crazy, ultra-wide, but it's not, like, it's not so tight that I can't fit anything into frame. Like, I can... I'm shooting this in a basement, and the camera's only like three feet away from me. And I have plenty of room in my frame for all of this clutter shit. Um, so, saying that you only used one lens does not impress me, because I didn't notice it, and just telling me that makes me think you wish I had noticed it, but I didn't, because who cares what equipment you used. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. we'll go for the age gap in the movie. Apparently, in the book that Call Me By Kimi no Nawa is based on, uh, the age gap is only supposed to be Oliver is 24 and Elio is 17. But in the movie, because Timothy Calumet looks like he's 15, and Army Hammer looks his age of more than 30, it looks very creepy to me like even 24 to 17 is an age gap that I'm not super on board with but it's not 24 to 17 is not a ridiculous age gap 30 to what looks like 15 mm, 
Okay. It's a bit weird. I mean, yes, Elio is the aggressor, but, ugh, weird. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Their romance sort of just comes out of nowhere after some very, very nonverbal and very vague physical flirting, sort of. Like, Oliver rubs Elio's shoulder at one point, but then asks a girl to come do it instead. To be like, here, d like, hook up with them or something. And then they hang out more and more and more, and then they just go for a non-food picnic and end up kissing and making out in the grass and, oh boy, who cares. Oh, and right before they had hooked up, um, hang on. Right before they hooked up, the mom is, like, reading an excerpt from a storybook, and it's... It just happens to be on the page where it's like, oh, the hero of the story, the, his main problem is he couldn't speak up. He couldn't tell his lover how he felt about her, so they never got together and he suffered forever. Hint, hint, audience. This is what's happening in the movie right now. Do you get it? Are, are we on the same page? Can we move on now? Okay. So, like, we'll get to The Shape of Water later, but The Shape of Water has some biblical stuff in it where Strickland will bring up some story, and it's relevant, but he brings it up because it's relevant. Call Me By Your Name does it in a way where, oh, it just happens to be perfectly relevant to the situation. And, like, not saying that doesn't happen in real life, but it's significantly less believable when it does in movies. Because someone had to write that in a movie. In real life, it's coincidence. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So, okay, one thing I do kind of like about the movie is the sound design. Like, there is a scene very early on where Elio and Oliver are sitting at a cafe and it's an outdoor cafe, and there are cars riding around, and they're actually having to yell over the cars and, like, people riding around on their bikes, ringing the fucking bells and stuff. That's cool. But then it gets disgusting later on in the movie, where there are two specific examples I'll bring up. One, spoilers. Um, Elio and Oliver had hooked up the night before, then Elio is being kind of distant from Oliver. Oliver goes over to Elio's room, knocks on his door, he opens the door. Oliver just wordlessly drops to his knees and sucks his dick for like five seconds. And it's just out of frame, it's like, down here. And all you hear is just mouth noises and it's, ugh, it's kind of gross. Um, and then he just pops up into frame, and he's like, Oh, good, you're hard again. Like, ugh. Uh, <laughs> and then there's another scene where Elio is in an attic, or it's just, it's just his spot in, like, the house or whatever. And he has an apricot, and I wrote peach, because I keep saying peach, but it's apricots all through the movie. Um, he has the peach, God damn it, and he's like, fingering the the top of it to like push his thumb into the core and to get the pit out but a it's very clearly supposed to be a butthole and apparently that's exactly what it's supposed to be in the book i'm not just looking into that in like i'm not just reading between lines at text that isn't there um it's definitely him fingering a butt and it looks as much like that. And it sounds just so much fucking just sloppy fruit noise. And then you hear him, well, you see him put the peach down and he's just masturbating with a apricot. And it's just amazing. Um, yeah, not something I actually want to listen to ever. 
Um, and then Oliver comes in and tries to eat the apricot, and he's like, no, don't do that. Um, in the book, he actually eats it. In the movie, he does not eat it. He just sort of dabs his finger on it and licks it. It's like, okay, you're... All right. You're doing that, except you're not. Um, and then, speaking of all the gay shit, there's more straight sex in this gay movie than there is gay sex. And if I feel like if you're gonna make a movie about a gay romance, just do it. Like, you don't need to still pander to the straight audience for this. I don't know. But, back to shit I don't like. It's basically Romeo and Romeo, and neither of them dies after their forbidden love. They just go on about their lives, except Elio is really, ha, huh, butthurt. Um, but, um, some of the dialogue, like, when they do the title drop, they're in bed, and it's like, call me by your name, and I'll call you by mine. And it just feels like Dane Cook going, Oh yeah, baby, my dick feels like corn. And Elio's right on point with, Give me the butter, baby. Um, but all this to say, I've heard better dialogue in actual gay porn. For example... Sometimes, I pull on it so hard, I rip the skin. Well, my daddy taught me a few things, too, like uh, how not to rip the skin by using someone else's mouth instead of your own hands. Will you show me? I'd be right happy to. And then we cut to my stupid video, and we're back now. So the only other thing I have to say about Call Me By Kimi no Nawa is Michael Stuhlbarg's speech. By the way, he's in, like, three of these movies. Uh, his speech at the end is really really unnatural and it feels like they were trying to emulate the speech from Goodwill Hunting except Michael Stuhlbarg as pleasant as he is is no Robin Williams and it was like it was like if Goodwill Hunting's speech was delivered by Will and he had recited it from a textbook like everything else in the movie Whereas um, Robin Williams' one was from life experience. Michael Stilbarg's one was just bleh. The only thing it was missing was, it's not your fault. So, call me by your name, second from the bottom, because fuck Lady Bird. Okay, on to the next one. Um, this one will be considerably shorter. It's Dunkirk. Dunkirk, I gave two tries to watch. I paid a dollar on Google to see it at home, and I fell asleep about half an hour in because I was like, oh my god, they gave you no reason to care about anyone in this movie. It's all just spectacle and really annoying sound and blah, blah, blah. I, I woke up when the credits started. Um, but then, when I got all the Best Picture nominees, I was like, oh my god, I can go see all of them because they're back in theaters. So I went to see Dunkirk in a theater that was like 30 miles away, um, because movie pass. And, uh, it was so much better in a theater that I'm going to say if you didn't see Dunkirk in the theater, you shouldn't see it at all. Um, because, like, at home... It's, it's definitely at least a large part my fault that I didn't enjoy it at home. Because at home I can sit here and get distracted, go on Reddit, all this bullshit. Um, but in a theater, you're in the theater. You, you're like, you have to turn off your phone, turn off the like screen on the watch, everything. And the sound is so much better. And a lot of Dunkirk is the sound... Um, because it adds to the spectacle. Plus, it just being not a dumb popcorn movie, but most of it is just like, holy shit, the crazy action, even though it's only PG-13 and there's not a drop of blood in the movie except for, like, the two times that there are. 
Um, so, like, um, yeah, if we don't care about anyone, theater experience is required, it sucks shit at home. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Like, as far as not caring about anybody, the pilots, like, there's, what, three sets of people that you're following throughout the movie? Um, following Scarecrow from the Dark Knight series. Uh, you're following him on a boat. You're following the guys that are actually on the beach. And then you're following the pilots. Um, Tom Hardy and the other guy, the pilots, um, they're the coolest part of the movie, probably because fighter jets are the coolest things ever. Oh, uh, wait, they're not jets. They were propeller airplanes, whatever. Um, they were the only cool guys because they seemed to have most of their shit together. And it sucks that Fortis One had to land on no power and got taken, and he burns his he burns his plane to the ground. I almost said jet again. Um, so that kind of sucked because the other guy lived. Uh, b -b 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 Scarecrow killed a kid. That was annoying. The old man was the best boy in the movie. I did not like how this movie is fucking color graded because everybody's hair is blue. Um, like, it's very blue and orange contrast thing. It looks weird in some places. Uh, b -b 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 Oh, and then the soundtrack is mostly just the ticking of a stopwatch, and it sounds very grating a lot of the time. It's like scare chords and ticking, and that's the whole soundtrack. I don't understand why Dunkirk is up for best score. I don't get it. So, we will sort of come back to Dunkirk later, because I feel that Dunkirk actually functions best as supplementary material for Darkest Hour, but we'll get to that when we get to it. So the next up, wait a minute. Oh my god, these are out of order. Ah! Phantom Thread should have been below Dunkirk. I'm sorry. I'm glad I didn't actually commit to editing this as a top nine. Back down one to Phantom Thread. God damn it. Um, we have this movie being directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, who is up for Best Director, and I can bet that maybe he'll get it because he worked with Daniel Day-Lewis, who was a crazy method actor asshole, who is apparently a nightmare to work with. So that's bonus points for Best Director. Um, so as far as the movie is concerned... Once again, back to the same complaint I had with Call Me By Your Name, I did not look like... I did not like how this movie looks, because it's a period accurate-ish... Like, when you make a movie look as shitty as the time period's technology would allow, it's sort of, like, I think it implies that no, this is just how shitty the world looked. It's almost like... It's not the camera's fault. The world used to just be in black and white. Right? Um, it's not in black and white, but it... I don't like how this movie looks. It's fucking annoying. Like... There's... It just seems hazy everywhere. Like, everything's dusty. Um, there is a very small central cast of only three named characters, really. Cyril, Reynolds, and Alma. Um, they all have a running gag to them. Cyril will always say something and then immediately follow it up with, let me be more direct and say it in a much more direct way, and people will immediately listen to her. Um, Reynolds is just an obsessive man-child about his work. He's very good at his job, but even the slightest thing throwing him off will just send him spurging out into, ah, this whole day is ruined, blah, 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 blah. He's a whiny bitch. Um, 
I mean, I can't say that the slightest inconvenience in the morning wouldn't fuck me up too, but I can at least sort of admit that it's at least partially my fault that I'm getting so upset. He does not. Uh, and then Alma is inconsiderate to Reynolds, even though he's a little bit of a fucking diva. Um, but, like, every time Alma's making breakfast or eating breakfast, all of the sound, once again, with sound design, all of the sound is, like, crazily amplified. Like, all of her chewing is extremely loud. All of the knife and fork scraping against the plate is extremely loud. Taking bites off of the fork is so loud. Like, the sound design is good uh, for those specifically. And... Um, oh, also, Alma poisons Reynolds as soon as it's, like, he doesn't pay enough attention to me. Although, to be fair, he totally wasn't paying enough attention to her. He was, <laughs> he was neglectful as hell. And in return, she was physically abusive in the form of literal poisoning. Uh, not enough to kill him, just enough that he would be, he would need nursing back to health. Which she was all too happy to do. But the relationship was absolutely disgusting. And the finale is, kiss me darling before I'm sick. Um, cause she poisons him again right in front of him and he eats the, uh, omelette on purpose. As a sort of, yes, I need a nurturing mother figure, and you will be that forever. And she's like, yeah, I will do that for you. So, blah, 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 blah. Huh, these are also out of order. I'm going to reorder this. So, the next one up is Get Out. Um, it's kind of weird that this one is up for best picture but okay uh, right at the start of the movie the song run rabbit run plays and it's that lovely soundtrack dissonance I love so much in everything where you have this pleasant jaunty song playing over someone Darius from Atlanta getting kidnapped violently so and uh, the song continues over the opening credits, and for the, like, few days after I saw Get Out in a theater, which, by the way, took me, like, a week of replanning when I was going to go see Get Out, um, I couldn't stop humming Run, Rabbit, Run. It's such a pleasant song. I love it. And then it comes up later in the movie. Um, just to sort of fully confirm whose car he's getting into at the end. Uh, bu bu bu. The coagula procedure is just some crazy shit to the point of... I, I almost consider the twist to be not fair in the sense that there is no fucking way you came up with this. Like, even with all the foreshadowing that's in the movie... The coagula uh, fucking procedure is so crazy out there that you're just like, what the fuck? Uh, all that said, I knew what the twist was before I went into the movie. And that's why I'm saying, like, God, this, this is still so weird, even though I knew exactly what it was. Okay. Um... The guy that plays Rod is consistently the funniest part of the movie, and he's playing a character that I usually would like be like, oh man, shut up, you're not funny. He's funny. He can pull it off. So, that's good. Um, pretty much everything in the first half of the movie gets called back in the second half, almost like Hot Fuzz or Shaun of the Dead, those kind of things. Uh, there's a cop at the very beginning of the movie who, he's the only real police officer in the movie. And then at the end of the movie, you see police 
lights on a car and you're like oh my god it's the cops um chris is gonna get framed i couldn't remember his name chris is gonna get framed for a bunch of murders and he's gonna get shot and it's gonna be just another thing that's like a statistic oh wait it's rod because he's tsa and he has a car that has police lights on it okay well that's cool you got away with it it's neato uh, I actually wrote, the race card is kind of the only card until the movie plays a Joker. Which, yeah. The coagula procedure is the Joker. It's so fucking out there. You're like, wait a minute, you're cheating. <laughs> Almost. It's, it's also kind of just a Black Mirror plot. Like, the current season of Black Mirror had an episode that somewhat is the coagula thing it just uh oh it's um it's black um black museum where they let the person be in your brain except it was it switches who's in the driver's seat um coagula puts the new host in the driver's seat whereas the black museum thing has the host body, it has the old person in the passenger seat, and they just have to ride along. It gives them no agency, whereas Get Out gives the new person, gives the old person control of their host body. So that's Get Out. Uh, we've next got The Post. Which I'm so excited to talk about, mostly because I made two stupid little skit things for it that you will see when I explain them. Um, the Post is one of four movies that I will say is most likely to win. Um, best Picture, I mean. Uh, I think The Post might win because President vs. News is the entire plot of The Post. And that's super relevant in current day because politics. Yay! Get your fucking politics out of my entertainment, please. Um, it's also likely to win because it has a busted tier all-star cast. You have Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep. That's overpowered enough as it is. You have Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. Coincidentally cast as just those two guys. So you have Mr. Show in this movie. Uh, Bob sort of goes his own way. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, there are some very goofy, over-the-top shots in this movie. Like they are to the point where you're like, oh yeah, this is made by Steven Spielberg. Uh, one of which is... Uh, Meryl Streep is sitting in a room by herself. No one else in the room. She's on the phone, and she's on the phone with two other people, and they're arguing back and forth with each other. So I will demonstrate this to you now. Not even 10 years old. She used to be a MILF. So, back to me. The other very stupid thing in this movie was at the very end where the case had gone to the Supreme Court and they held out the decision for dramatic tension by saying, Well, I'll just show you my clip. Wait, everybody, we have the Supreme Court result. The Supreme Court ruled six to three in favor of. Hold for emphasis. Who won? The Washington Post. And back to what I was saying about the all star cast Michael Stuhlbarg is in this movie too. And he's underused as hell. But, whatever. The Post is alright. Also, that newspaper will probably be the same newspaper if I ever use a newspaper as a plot. Plot? Prop. 
If I ever use a newspaper as a prop again, it's always going to be that one. Probably. Because, dude, newspapers are like $4. That's fucking insane. Who buys newspapers? Um... Ugh. How long have I been talking? I have no way of knowing. Anyways, next we go to The Darkest Hour. It has... Definitely the Oscar bait aesthetic. What do I mean by Oscar bait aesthetic? Everything looks dusty. Everything is in... Hang on. I will demonstrate this with a lighting change. Ba -ba -ba. Everything looks dusty and all the lights look like this except not nearly as overexposed. Um, they, they actually do it kind of right. Nope, that's... There's too much saturation in my image, god damn it! Um, but you know what I'm talking about. Oscar bait movies look a certain way, and like they have a specific aesthetic, and this definitely has that. Uh, Darkest Hour is also why I bothered to clutter up the frame b and shoot in as wide a frame as I do, do, did. Because um, of all the Best Picture nominees, minus Shape of Water, uh, I liked its general aesthetic the best. Uh, but, let's see... We had the wide cluttered shots, which leads me to say that all the set designs are really cool, especially the um, the Parliament set, which I guess could just be a big courtroom, but whatever. Um, you get like plenty of shots of Churchill's breakfast, and I don't mean the drink. Uh, he has like there's a lot of excess to Churchill. Like, he is one of those larger-than-life type people. Uh, his voice just kind of... For the longest time, it was grating on me. And I was like, D did fucking Winston Churchill actually sound like that? I've never actually heard the man talk. But he sounded, like, droopy. It was weird. Um, no, back to the Oscar bait aesthetic thing. It... God damn it. I list, um, one of the things I listed is everything looks dusty, and I think the last time that they show Parliament, um, there is just this weird fucking cloud of smoke in there, and it's not like every single person in there was smoking a cigar, even Churchill wasn't smoking, and... By the way, when he is smoking throughout the movie, I think I only ever saw him blow the smoke out of his mouth once. Which was strange. Um, but yeah, it was dusty to the point of there actually being a literal cloud in one of the parliament shots. And it was very strange. Um, and then, all going all the way back to what I said about Dunkirk... I think that Dunkirk would actually work best as supplementary material for this movie. Because the... Not battle, but... The rescue miracle at Dunkirk is one of the central plot points of Darkest Hour. So, like, if a lot of the time when Churchill's, like, going back and forth as to what to do about Dunkirk... If they just cut, like, intercut footage from Dunkirk to Darkest Hour, if you were to just cut back and forth between them, I think it could amplify both movies. Because it could be like, well, here's what's going on, and here's how much they're actually trying to save us. And here's what's going on, here's exactly why we need to hurry up and save these guys. Like, I think each one can supplement the other in a really cool way. Um, let's move on to Three Billboards, which I actually recorded its own video, but 
then I was like, no, I am not going to make a separate video for all of the Oscar nominees. That's a lot of videos that I would need to make for a bunch of movies I didn't necessarily want to see for any other reason than they're nominated for Best Picture. Um, so I did actually record a Three Billboards video and that will not go up. This will be that. So, let's see. Uh, Frances McDormand is apparently the front runner for Best Lead Actress, which I don't think she should get. She did a good job, but I don't think she should get Best Lead Actress. Uh, Woody Harrelson is Best Boy, is something that I have in here. He is the only pleasant character in all of Three Billboards, except maybe the guy that, um that actually runs the billboard ad company. He's kind of pleasant too. And the one black dude. And the other black dude that's from The Wire. There's a lot of unnamed characters or characters whose names I don't remember. Like I don't, oh, Chief Willoughby. And the only reason I remember Woody Harrelson's character's name is because it's on one of the billboards. Um, Sam Rockwell's character is fine. But he turns into a genius martyr detective overnight. Like, he was okay and totally believable as a violent, stupid, angry bigot for, like, 80% of the movie. And then in the last 20, 30 minutes, he just becomes completely selfless. And is just an amazing detective, all because he read a letter from Chief Willoughby that said he would be a good detective. So he just is one. What? Um. Oh, <laughs> I have Sam Rockwell as Mac's brother, uh, as far as Always Sunny in Philadelphia is confirmed. I only have this written because Mac's mom is Sam Rockwell's mom. Uh... Cinematography was on point. The movie has title drops everywhere, and one of the title drops is the very first shot of the movie that's just a wide shot of all three billboards. You got like one here, one here, and one way over there. It's it's neato. But the cinematography being on point actually fucks up the movie in one or two, but they're the same thing specific spots, which is the news broadcasts, since they are shown taking up the entire frame as if the camera is just pressed up against the camera lens, uh, since they're shown that way, it sort of implies that the news broadcast is also in 235 to 1, and the same cinem cinematographer that did the movie itself works on the news broadcasts <laughs> because the news broadcast is just as well shot as the rest of the movie including the news reporter herself being like right around here-ish in the frame where I am so they put some effort into that rather than putting the news broadcaster squared up right in the center of the frame and full like depth of field in the background like you can see everything no <laughs> you get shallow depth of field and some rule of thirds and some actual shot composition going on. It's like, oh my god, what is this guy doing working as a news broadcaster? He should be working on movies. Um, <laughs> once again, actually, I don't know if once again. Maybe I only mentioned this in the, mo in the uh, video that won't go up. Uh, the title drops are all over the place. They keep saying three billboards, them three billboards, those three billboards. I wish any time a movie did a title drop, they had to say the entire title. I kind of ruined this movie because I kept thinking of this. Um, I want it to be, any time they say three billboards, they have to say three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Every time. Like, that would make it so dumb, but I would like movies to do that. 
<laughs> it would be horrible, but it would be funny for a bit. And it would force movies not to drop the title. It's fucking annoying. Um, it is second place for me as far as Best Picture is concerned. Uh, and it ends ambiguously. Mildred and Dixon, Sam Rockwell, are going to kill a guy. And then as they're leaving, they're like, do you really want to kill this guy? Uh, we'll figure it out on the way. Like, maybe they're giving up on their quest for vengeance. So, whatever. Mm. And now, we need another lighting change. Because it would be incorrect to do it the other way. So, The Shape of Water is my pick for best picture. No shit. Uh, once again, Michael Stuhlbarg is in the movie, and he is outstanding. He's not even close to a main character, really, but he's just great. Everyone in this movie is great. Strickland is fucking fantastic because he's just perfectly an asshole, and you only ever need to hate him, and he's perfectly hateable. Um, I did see this movie twice, I saw it once on my own, and then I saw it again when my friend was like, Hey, let's go see The Shape of Water, or um, is it still out in theaters? I want to go see it. I was like, yeah, I can go for free. I'll just go see one of the other Best Picture movies later. Um, there's biblical references all over the place to the point that the entire movie... Like, my friend was able to perfectly plot out the entire movie from, like maybe an hour in like it's kind of a long movie but maybe at the midpoint or even earlier my friend had the entire movie called um, it's when the asset is standing in the theater and Exodus is playing on the screen and there was something else with Samson and there might have been a reference to Moses or something. Maybe it was just that Exodus was playing. But once that happened, he was like, I got this movie. Like, I know the whole plot now. And he did. Which, you know, that's cool. Uh, the, the whole plot, by the way, is Eliza is Moses and the asset is Jews. Uh... There's the whole Samson thing with um, Strickland as well. Uh, back to... God, my notes are, like, sparse for this movie, and they should be much more detailed. Um, Giles is great, a.k.a. Mr. Doback from uh, Step Brothers. He's just the most pleasant old gay man ever. I, and I really like his tie. He has this... I think he calls it a butterscotch tie or something. But it just looks comfy. The texture on it just looks fucking comfortable. And I want it. And he has lovely sweater vests, too. Um, oh, I meant one of the things that I actually managed to sell my friend on seeing this is that I told him, like, it looks... Like, there are points, because most of the stuff is practical in the movie, and not bullshit CG. Um, it actually feels more like a stage play at some points. And after I said that, and when we went into the theater, I realized how correct that was because I had forgotten how much like actual theater shit there is in this movie. Like Eliza and Giles are always watching like plays or just show tunes -y things to the point that Eliza can even tap dance um, and then there's the one scene where it actually becomes a little stage play which is it was so cool um, it has the most nominations of everything which is kind of surprising oh and by the way 
when I said that Frances McDormand shouldn't get Best Lead Actress, I think that Sally Hawkins should get it for The Shape of Water. Because she doesn't actually say a word in the entire movie, and no singing You'll Never Know How Much I Love You does not count. That was an imagined spot anyways. Um, I think that she had the best performances of everybody. She has a monologue completely in sign language where you can basically see a person screaming their lungs out without making a sound. It's fucking incredible. Best speech I've seen in a movie in recent memory. It's fucking amazing. Uh, we have the absolutely awesome score for the movie. It's just, it's memorable. Remember when you could hum a theme song to a thing? You can't do that with most movies. You can maybe do that with like the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Or, hmm, what else can I even think of that's a big movie that actually has a memorable fucking score. Not much. So, there was another one. Just like Run Rabbit Run with Get Out, I couldn't get the score of The Shape of Water out of my head. I was listening to it on shuffle after the second viewing for like a week straight. Um, you have... The reason that I have green as one of the colors going on right now is because green is evil in The Shape of Water. There's Strickland's candy, the jello, um, specifically the jello that Strickland's wife uh, makes for him, the car, which is teal, but people keep calling it green. You have the key lime pie in uh, fucking... What is the pie? The pie shop. God damn it. Their mascot's pie boy. Whatever. The bigoted racist fucking pie shop owner is a scumbag. And Giles always gets key lime pie from him. Because he thinks he's hot. Um, but the one time that he doesn't get key lime pie is when he realizes that he was pining for a bigoted racist. So... The green wore off, or whatever. Uh, and I think, I think the Shape of Water is the the movie that should win on its own merit, rather than for stupid political climate reasons. Um, Shape of Water is actually the best movie in my opinion. Three Billboards is next. Again, not for political reasons. But then, the two that might win, I already mentioned The Post might win because President versus News. The other one that most frustratingly might win is Lady Bird. Because, written and directed by a woman, it was her first try, and it got the best reviews of everything ever on Rotten Tomatoes, but... It's also the year of Me Too and Time's Up and Empower the Women. But Lady Bird's not a good movie. It sucks. It's so boring. And it's shot like shit. Ah, it looks so bad. And nothing happens. So there you go, my Oscar movie roundup. Now to get to editing, and this shouldn't be as hard to... It... This should be easier for me to edit than the dumb skits I made for the post. So, I'll see you guys when I go see a movie for fun, rather than going to see it because I want to make a thing for a show that I don't even like. Seriously, the Academy is a bunch of fucking retards. The Oscars are pointless. Maybe I'll make another one, though, going through every category of the Oscars. See you next time.
Blade Runner is the best picture, though. It's the best one. Why didn't it get nominated? Fuck the Academy. <laughs>